Imagine, if you can, a small room, hexagonal in shape like the cell of a bee. It is lighted neither by window nor by lamp, yet it is filled with a soft radiance. There are no apertures for ventilation, yet the air is fresh. There are no musical instruments, and yet, at the moment that my meditation opens, this room is throbbing with melodious sounds. An armchair is in the center, by its side a reading desk. That is all the furniture. And in the armchair, there sits a swaddled lump of flesh. A woman, about five feet high, with a face as white as a fungus. It is to her that the little room belongs. An electric bell rang. The woman touched a switch, and the music was silent. I suppose I must see who it is, she thought, and set her chair in motion. The chair, like the music, was worked by machinery, and it rolled her to the other side of the room, where the bell still rang importunately. Who is it? Her voice was irritable, for she had been interrupted often since the music began. She knew several thousand people. In certain directions, human intercourse had advanced enormously. But when she listened into the receiver, her white face wrinkled into smiles. Very well. Let us talk. I will isolate myself. I do not expect anything important will happen for the next five minutes, for I can give you fully five minutes, Kuno. Then I must deliver my lecture on music during the Australian period. She touched the isolation knob so that no one else could speak to her. Then she touched the lighting apparatus, and then the little room was plunged into darkness. Be quick, Kuno. Here I am in the dark, wasting my time. But it was fully fifteen seconds before the round plate that she held in her hands began to glow. A faint blue light shot across it, darkening to purple, and presently she could see the image of her son, who lived on the other side of the earth, and he could see her. Kuno, how slow you are! He smiled gravely. I really believe you enjoy dawdling. I have called you before, mother, but you were always busy or isolated. I have something particular to say. What is it, dearest boy? Be quick! Why could you not send it by pneumatic post? Because I prefer saying such a thing. I want. Well. I want you to come and see me. Vashti watched his face in the blue plate. But I can see you. What more do you want? I want to see you, not through the machine. I want to speak to you, not through the wearisome machine. Oh, hush! You mustn't say anything against the machine. Why not? One mustn't. You talk as if a god had made the machine. I believe that you pray to it when you are unhappy. Men made it. Do not forget that. Great men. But men, the machine is much, but it is not everything. I see something like you in this plate, but I do not see you. I hear something like you through this telephone, but I do not hear you. That is why I want you to come, pay me a visit, so that we can meet face to face and talk about the hopes that are in my mind. She replied that she could scarcely spare the time for a visit. The airship barely takes two days to fly between me and you. I dislike airships. Why? I dislike seeing the horrible brown earth and the sea and the stars when it is dark. I get no ideas in an airship. I do not get them anywhere else. What kind of ideas can the air give you? He paused for an instant. Do you not know four big stars that form an oblong, and three stars close together in the middle of the oblong, and hanging from these stars three other stars? No. I do not dislike the stars, but did they give you an idea? How interesting! Tell me. I had an idea that they were like a man. I do not understand. The four big stars are the man's shoulders and his knees. The three stars in the middle are like the belts that man wore once, and the three stars hanging are like a sword. A sword. Men carried swords about with them to kill animals and other men. It does not strike me as a very good idea, but it is certainly original. When did it come to you first? In the airship. He broke off, and she fancied that he looked sad. She could not be sure, for the machine did not transmit nuances of expression. 
It only gave a general idea of people, an idea that was good enough for all practical purposes, Vashti thought. The imponderable bloom, declared by a discredited philosophy to be the actual essence of intercourse, was rightly ignored by the machine, just as the imponderable bloom of the grape was ignored by the manufacturers of artificial fruit. Something good enough had long since been accepted by our race. The truth is that I want to see these stars again. They are curious stars. I, I want to see them, not from the airship, but from the surface of the Earth, as our ancestors did thousands of years ago. I want to visit the surface of the Earth. Vashti looked shocked. Mother, you must come, if only to explain to me what is the harm of visiting the surface of the Earth. No harm, but no advantage either. The surface of the Earth is only dust and mud, no advantage. The surface of the Earth is only dust and mud, no life remains on it, and you would need a respirator, or the cold of the outer air will kill you. One dies immediately in the outer air. I know. Of course I shall take all precautions. And besides... Well? She considered, and chose her words with care. Her son had a queer temper, and she wished to dissuade him from the expedition. It is contrary to the spirit of the age. Do you mean by that, contrary to the machine? In a sense, but... His image in the blue plate faded. Kuno! He had isolated himself. For a moment, Vashti felt lonely. Then she generated the light, and the sight of her room, flooded with radiance and studded with electric buttons, revived her. There were buttons and switches everywhere. Buttons to call for food, for music, for clothing. There was the hot bath button by pressure of which a basin of imitation marble rose out of the floor, filled to the brim with a warm, deodorized liquid. There was the cold bath button. There was the button that produced literature. And there were, of course, the buttons by which she communicated with her friends. The room, though it contained nothing, was in touch with all that she cared for in the world. Vashti's next move was to turn off the isolation switch and all the accumulations of the last three minutes burst upon her. The room was filled with the noise of bells and speaking tubes. What was the new food like? Could she recommend it? Had she had any ideas lately? Might one tell her one's own ideas? Would she make an engagement to visit the public nurseries at an early date, say, this day month? To most of these questions, she replied with irritation a growing quality in that accelerated age. She said that the new food was horrible, that she could not visit the public nurseries through press of engagements, that she had no ideas of her own but had just been told one. That four stars and three in the middle were like a man. She doubted there was very much in it. Then she switched off her correspondence, for it was time to deliver her lecture on Australian music. The clumsy system of public gatherings had been long since abandoned. Neither Vashti nor her audience stirred from their rooms. Seated in her armchair, she spoke, while they in their armchairs heard her fairly well, and saw her fairly well. She opened with her humorous account of music in the pre-Mongolian epoch, and went on to describe the great outburst of song that followed the Chinese conquest. Remote and primeval, as were the methods of Isan So and the Brisbane School. She yet felt, she said, that study of them might repay the musicians of today. They had freshness. They had, above all, ideas. Her lecture, which lasted ten minutes, was well received, and at its conclusion she and many of her audience listened to a lecture on the sea. There were ideas to be got from the sea, the speaker had donned a respirator and visited it recently. Then she fed, talked to many friends, had a bath, talked again, and summoned her bed. The bed was not to her liking. It was too large, and she had a feeling for a small bed. But complaint was useless, for beds were the same dimension all over the world, and to have an alternate size would have involved vast alterations in the machine. Vashti isolated herself. It was necessary, for neither day nor night existed under the ground, and reviewed all that had happened since she had summoned her bed last. Ideas? Scarcely any. Events? Was Kuno's invitation an event? 
By her side on the little reading desk was a survival from the ages of litter. One book. This was the book of the machine. In it were instructions against every possible contingency. If she was hot or cold or dyspeptic or at a loss for a word, she went to the book and it told her which button to press. The central committee published it and in accordance with a growing habit, it was richly bound. Sitting up in the bed, she took it reverently in her hands. She glanced around the glowing room as if someone might be watching her. Then, half ashamed, half joyful, she murmured, Oh, machine. And raised the volume to her lips. Thrice she kissed it, thrice inclined her head, thrice she felt the delirium of acquiescence. Her ritual performed, she turned to page 1367, which gave the times of the departure of the airships from the island in the southern hemisphere, under whose soil she lived, to the island in the northern hemisphere, where under lived her son. I have not the time. She shook her head in consternation. Vashti made the room dark and slept. She awoke and made the room light. She ate and exchanged ideas with her friends and listened to music and attended lectures. She made the room dark and slept. Above her, beneath her, and around her, the machine hummed eternally. She did not notice the noise, for she had been born with it in her ears. The earth carrying her hummed as it sped through silence, turning her now to the invisible sun, now to the invisible stars. She awoke and made the room light. Kuno! I will not talk to you until you come. Have you been to the surface of the earth since we spoke last? Kuno's image had faded. Again, Vashti consulted the book. She became very nervous and lay back in her chair, palpitating. Think of her as without teeth or hair. Presently, she directed the chair to the wall and pressed an unfamiliar button. The wall swung apart slowly. Through the opening, she saw a tunnel that curved slightly so that its goal was not visible. Should she go to see her son, here was the beginning of the journey. Of course, she knew all about the communication system. There was nothing mysterious in it. She would summon a car, and it would fly with her down the tunnel until it reached the lift that communicated with the airship station. The system had been in use for many, many years, long before a universal establishment of the machine. And of course, she had studied the civilization that had immediately preceded her own. The civilization that had mistaken the functions of the system, and had used it for bringing people to things instead of for bringing things to people. Those funny old days when men went for a change of air instead of changing the air in their rooms. And yet she was frightened of the tunnel. She had not seen it since her last child was born. It curved, but not quite as she remembered. It was brilliant, but not quite as brilliant as a lecturer had suggested. Vashti was seized with the terrors of direct experience. She shrank back into the room, and the wall closed up again. Kuno, I cannot come to see you. I am not well. Immediately, an enormous apparatus fell onto her out of the ceiling. A thermometer was automatically laid upon her heart. She lay powerless. Cool pads soothed her forehead. Kuno had telegraphed to her doctor. So the human passion still blundered up and down in the machine. Vashti drank the medicine that the automated doctor projected into her mouth, and the machinery retired into the ceiling. The voice of Kuno was heard asking how she felt. Better. But why do you not come to me instead? Because I cannot leave this place. Why? Because any moment something tremendous may happen. Have you been on the surface of the earth yet? Not yet. Then what is it? I will not tell you through the machine. And so, she resumed her life. But she thought of Kuno as a baby, his birth, his removal to the public nurseries, her own visit to him there, his visits to her, visits which stopped when the machine had assigned him to a room on the other side of the earth. Parents, do this, said the book of the machine. She said the moment of birth. P. Dot, four two two three two seven four eight three. True, but there was something special about Kuno. Indeed, there had been something special about all of her children. And after all, she must brave the journey if he desired it. And 
something tremendous might happen. What did that mean? The nonsense of a youthful man, no doubt. But she must go. Again, she pressed the unfamiliar button. Again, the wall swung back, and she saw the tunnel that curves out of sight. Clasping the book, she rose, tottered onto the platform, and summoned the car. Her room closed behind her. The journey to the Northern Hemisphere had begun. Of course it was perfectly easy. The car approached, and in it she found armchairs exactly like her own. When she signaled, it stopped, and she tottered onto the lift. One other passenger was in the lift, the first fellow creature she had seen face to face for months. Few traveled in these days, for thanks to the advance of science, the earth was exactly alike all over. Rapid intercourse, from which the previous civilization had hoped so much, had ended by defeating itself. What was the good of going to Peking if it was just like Shrewsbury? Why return to Shrewsbury when it would all be like Peking? Men seldom moved their bodies. All unrest was concentrated in the soul. The airship service was a relic from the former age. It was kept up because it was easier to keep it up than stop it or to diminish it, but it now far exceeded the wants of the population. Vessel after vessel would rise from the vomitories of Rye or Christchurch, I use the antique names, would sail into the crowded sky and would draw up at the wharves of the south empty. So nicely adjusted was the system, so independent of meteorology, that the sky, whether calm or cloudy, resembled a vast kaleidoscope whereon the same patterns periodically recurred. The ship on which Vashti sailed started now at sunset, now at dawn, but always as it passed above Reyes, it would neighbor the ship that served between Helsinki and the Brazils, and every third time it surmounted the Alps, the fleet of Palermo would cross its track behind. Night and day, wind and storm, tide and earthquake impeded man no longer. He had harnessed Leviathan. All the old literature, with its praise of nature and its fear of nature, rang false as the prattle of a child. Yet as Vashti saw the vast flank of the ship stained with exposure to the outer air, her horror of direct experience returned. It was not quite like the airship in the cinematophote. For one thing, it smelt. Not strongly or unpleasantly, but it did smell and with her eyes shut, she should have known that a new thing was close to her. Then she had to walk from it to the lift, had to submit to the glances from the other passengers. The man in the front dropped his book. No great matter, but it disquieted them all. In the rooms, if a book was dropped, the floor raised it mechanically, but the gangway to the airship was not so prepared, and the sacred volume lay motionless. They stopped. The thing was unforeseen, and the man, instead of picking up his property, felt the muscles of his arm to see how they had failed him. Then someone actually said with direct utterance, We shall be late, and they trooped on board, Vashti treading on the pages as she did so. Inside her anxiety increased. The arrangements were old-fashioned and rough. There was even a female attendant to whom she would have to announce her wants during the voyage. Of course a revolving platform rang the length of the ship, but she was expected to walk from it to her cabin. Some cabins were better than others, and she did not get the best. She thought that the attendant had been unfair, and spasms of rage shook her. The glass valves had closed, and she could not go back. She saw at the end of the vestibule the lift in which she had ascended going quietly up and down empty. Beneath those corridors of shining tiles were rooms tier below tier, reaching far into the earth, and in each room there sat a human being, eating or sleeping or producing ideas, and buried deep in the hive was her own room. Vashti was afraid. Oh, machine, she murmured, and caressed her book, and was comforted. Then the sides of the vestibule seemed to melt together, as do the passages that we see in dreams. The lift vanished. The book that had been dropped slid to the left and vanished. Polished tiles rushed by like a stream of water. There was a slight jar, and the airship issuing from its tunnel soared above the waters of a tropical ocean. It was night. For a moment, she saw the coast of Sumatra, edged by the phosphorescence of waves and crowned by lighthouses, 
still sending forth their disregarded beams. These also vanished, and only the stars distracted her. They were not motionless, but swayed to and fro above her head, thronging out of one skylight into another, as if the universe and not the airship was careening. And as often happens on clear nights, they seemed to now be in perspective, now on a plane, now piled tier beyond tier into the infinite heavens, now concealing infinity, a roof limiting forever the visions of men. In either case, they seemed intolerable. Are we to travel in the dark? called the passengers angrily, and the attendant, who had been careless, generated the light and pulled down the blinds of pliable metal. When the airships had been built, the desire to look direct at things still lingered in the world. Hence the extraordinary number of skylights and windows, and the proportionate discomfort to those who were civilized and refined. Even in Vashti's cabin, one star peeped through a flaw in the blind, and after a few hours' uneasy slumber, she was disturbed by an unfamiliar glow, which was the dawn. Quick as the ship had sped westwards, the earth had rolled eastwards quicker still, and it dragged back Vashti and her companions towards the sun. Science could prolong the night, but only for a little, and those high hopes of neutralizing the Earth's diurnal revolution had passed, together with hopes that were possibly higher. To keep pace with the sun, or even to outstrip it, had been the aim of the civilization preceding this. Racing airplanes had been built for this purpose, capable of enormous speed and steered by the greatest intellects of the epoch. Round the globe they went, round and round, westward, westward, round and round, amidst humanity's applause, in vain. The globe went eastward quicker still, horrible accidents occurred, and the committee of the machine, at the time rising into prominence, declared the pursuit illegal, unmechanical, and punishable by homelessness. Of homelessness, more will be said later. Doubtless the committee was right, yet the attempt to defeat the sun aroused the last common interest that our race experienced about the heavenly bodies, or indeed about anything. It was the last time that men were compacted by thinking of a power outside the world. The sun had conquered, yet it was the end of his spiritual dominion. Dawn, midday, twilight, the zodiacal path touched neither men's lives nor their hearts, and science had long since retreated into the ground to concentrate herself upon problems that she was certain of solving. So when Vashti found her cabin invaded by a rosy finger of light, she was annoyed and tried to adjust the blind. But the blind flew up altogether, and she saw through the skylight small pink clouds swaying against a background of blue, and as the sun crept higher, its radiance entered direct, brimming down the wall like a golden sea. It rose and fell with the airship's motion, just as waves rise and fall, but it advanced steadily as a tide advances. Unless she was careful, it would strike her face. A spasm of horror shook her, and she rang for the attendant. The attendant was too horrified, but she could do nothing. It was not her place to mend the blind. She could only suggest that the lady should change her cabin, which she accordingly prepared to do. People were almost exactly alike all over the world. But the attendant of the airship, perhaps owing to her exceptional duties, had grown a little out of the common. She had to often address passengers with direct speech, and this had given her a certain roughness and originality of manner. So when Vashti swerved away from the sunbeams with a cry, the attendant behaved barbarically and put out her hand to steady her. How dare you! You forget yourself! The attendant was confused and apologized for not having let her fall. People never touched one another. The custom had become obsolete, owing to the machine. Where are we now? We are over Asia. The attendant seemed most anxious to be polite. Asia? You must excuse my common way of speaking. I have got into the habit of calling places over which I pass by their unmechanical names. Oh, I remember Asia. The Mongols came from it. Beneath us in the open air stood a city called Simla. Have you ever heard of the Mongols and of the Brisbane School? No. Brisbane also stood in the open air. Those mountains to the right, let me show you. She pushed back a metal blind. The main chain of the Himalayas was revealed. They were once called the roof of the world, those mountains. 
You must remember that before the dawn of civilization, they seemed to be an impenetrable wall that touched the stars. We supposed that no one but the gods could exist above their summits. How we have advanced, thanks to the machine. How we have advanced, thanks to the machine. How we have advanced, thanks to the machine, echoed the passenger who had dropped his book the night before and who was standing in the passage. And that wide effulgence there, in the cracks, what is it? I have forgotten its name. Cover the window, please. These mountains give me no ideas. The northern aspect of the Himalayas was in deep shadow. On the Indian slope, the sun had just prevailed. The forest had been destroyed during the literature epoch for the purpose of making newspaper pulp, but the snows were awakening to their morning glory, and clouds still hung on the breasts of Kinchinjunga. In the plain were seen the ruins of cities, with diminished rivers creeping by their walls, and by the sides of these were sometimes the signs of vomitories marking the cities of today. Over the whole prospect, airships rushed, crossing the intercrossing with incredible aplomb, and then rising nonchalantly when they desire to escape the perturbations of the lower atmosphere, and to traverse the roof of the world. We have indeed advanced, thanks to the machine, repeated the attendant, and hid the Himalayas behind a metal blind. The day dragged wearily forward. The passengers sat, each in his cabin, avoiding one another with an almost physical repulsion, and longing to be once more under the surface of the earth. There were eight or ten of them, mostly young males, sent out from the public nurseries to inhabit the rooms of those who had died in various parts of the earth. The man who had dropped his book was on the homeward journey. He had been sent to Sumatra long ago for the purpose of propagating the race. Vashti alone was traveling by her private will. At midday, she took a second glance at the earth. The airship was crossing another range of mountains, but she could see little owing to clouds. Masses of black rock hovered below her and merged indistinctly into gray. Their shapes were fantastic. One of them resembled a prostrate man. No ideas here, murmured Vashti and hid the Caucasus behind a metal blind. In the evening, she looked again. They were crossing a golden sea, in which lay many small islands and one peninsula. She repeated, No ideas here. And hid Greece behind a metal blind. This concludes part one, the airship. Stay tuned for The Machine Stops Part 2, The Mending Apparatus. Special thanks go to guest voices, Mike Bennett as Kuno, Sally Clausen as Vashti, and Tristy Taylor as the airship attendant. Music on the program provided by freesound.org. The theme song, Optimist, performed by Zoe Keating. So, listeners, let's hope the machine keeps going, well, at least long enough to get us through the next few episodes, so, until next time, goodbye for now, and thanks for listening.